Welcome to Is There Any Word from the Lord, where we discuss uh, difficult Bible topics and subjects, and one of those subjects is for, especially today, when we're going to be talking about the earnest of the Holy Spirit. What is the earnest of the Holy Spirit, and how does that uh, apply to God's plan of redemption? Well, I hope we can look at that when we look at these three main points for our lesson today. We're going to look at the different views that have been given by various pre preachers on the earnest of the Spirit. We're going to look at the definitions of what, how the Bible defines the earnest. And then we're going to look at the design and purpose of the earnest of the Spirit. So with the different views on the earnest, as you can see on this chart, there are many different views. Some believe that the language is literal there, that, and some would believe that under that comes that the earnest is miraculous. Uh, they believe, some believe it's for all time. Some would say it's for the first century. Some would say the earnest is non-miraculous and that it's a pledge of salvation for the Christian that when you become a Christian, you, have this, uh, you earn this as a pledge of salvation. Some would say that the earnest is the Word of God. But then what some would take the language as being figurative and that then under this category, some would say it's miraculous. Well, okay, is it for all time or is it for the first century? And then is maybe is the earnest non-miraculous, and then some would say that the earnest would be the personal indwelling of the Spirit, and some would sadly say that it's the direct operation of the Spirit. Well, we, as we well know, we can take off some of these, such as the earnest being miraculous for all time under either category, because we know that miracles have ceased, because of 1 Corinthians 13, 8-10 teaches that. But some would also teach, uh, t we should also know that it cannot be a direct operation of the Holy Spirit because we know that Calvinism, when we study it very carefully, that it's not found in God's Word. Calvinism is a false system of, of, of religion. And so we know it cannot be referring to a direct operation. Well, that brings us to our definitions. Uh, we want to look at some lexicons that define this word, which is the word Erebon. And here's how Thayer defines it. To pledge a word which seems to have passed from the Phoenicians to the Greeks and thence into Latin. And earnest, money which in purchases is given as a pledge that the full amount will subsequently be paid. Here's what Vine writes in his lexicon. Originally, earnest money deposited by the purchaser and forfeited if the purchase was not completed was probably a Phoenician word introduced into Greece. In general usage, it came to denote a pledge or earnest of any sort. In the New Testament, it is used of that which is assured by God to believers. In modern Greek, Erebona is an engagement ring. Now, with regards to earnest, I think we need to point out that it's not referring to what's called a down payment, as some have claimed. Uh, because an earnest is now a down payment because of two reasons. Number one, one could give a, a diamond ring as earnest in purchasing something and then get the ring back when he finalizes the deal. Or another reason is that earnest money is simply a guarantee that one will not go back on the deal. And so I want us to see that there is a, dis a distinction between earnest money and down payment. In fact, in Genesis 38, 1 through 5, we see the word Arabona used in the Septuagint. And I want us to see how it's used in the Bible. It says, It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her, so she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again, bore a son, she called his name Onan. She conceived yet again, she bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was at Chizib when she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah, Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. 
Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he admitted on the ground lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Therefore he killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, His daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, Lest he also die like his brothers. Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shears at Timnah. He and his friend Hira the Adalamite at Timnah. He and his friends Hira the Adalamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah so she, to shear his sheep. So she took her, off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in the open place which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, because she had covered her face. And he turned to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, What will you give me, that you may come in to me? And he said, I will send you a young goat for the flock. So she said, Will you give me a pledge till you send it? Then he said, What pledge? Shall I give you? That's that word, Arabona, Arabon. So she said, Your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then he gave them to her and went into her, and she could see by him. So she arose, went away, and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. Now, basically what goes on there is that Judah finds out that it was Tamar. How do you know it was Tamar? Because she still held as an earnest this his staff and some of his items so i want us to get that from this passage of scripture where this word was used in the in the word of god so that's where we go to looking at the definition to looking at how we are to look at the design and purpose of the earnest well, we're going to look at three main passages of scripture second corinthians 1 ephesians 1 and second corinthians 5. notice what second corinthians 1 21 22 says now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the guarantee of the Spirit in our hearts. Now the question we must discuss with any passage of Scripture is, who is the us? Who is the our in this passage? Well, I think we need to look back at 2 Corinthians 1 verse 1, and it gives us the answer. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who are in all Achaia. And then in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 19, it goes on to say, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, by me, Savannah, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. So when we read 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22, you have to read in regards to the original context that it's talking to Paul, Timothy, and Silas. So let's read it again. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us, Paul, Timothy, and Silas, and given us, Paul, Silas, and, and Timothy, the guarantee of the Spirit in our, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, hearts. So when we look at this, we want to recognize what is that anointing talking about? Well, I think what we see there is talking about miraculous endowment. Just as we saw uh, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit, at his baptism. So we see there's this miraculous endowment upon Paul, uh, Timothy, and Silas. Well, what is the sealing? Well, we talked about that in another lesson where it refers to confirmation or authenticity of the message by means of miracles. And then we want to talk about, well, what's this earnest, what's this guarantee or, or pledge, as some translate it? Well, there are some clues I think we can get from this passage of Scripture. Number one, it's something that's given by the Holy Spirit. So we need to recognize that fact. Secondly, it was in the hearts of these three men, of these three messengers of God. And then thirdly, it was something that's trustworthy. You could fully depend upon God to deliver, and God definitely would not go back on the deal. So it's really interesting when we read 2 Corinthians 1, 18 through 20, the Bible says, But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sabanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but him was yes. 
For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him amen to the glory of God through us. And what we see there is basically that Paul is trying to explain to the brethren, listen, all the promises that we see in the Old Testament, we see that they're fulfilled in, in, under the New Covenant. We see that the promises are now being fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to, to fulfill the law and the prophets. As Jesus would say, I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And so here we see God's Word coming to pass. That in Jesus, you can depend on Him. He is the Amen. He is the one that you can put your trust in. And so that's what Paul is trying to explain here because we see the whole context revolves around how there were certain men who were disregarding Paul's apostleship called the Judaizers. And they were basically questioning Paul's apostleship. But how could we show that Paul was a true apostle? By him being able to miraculously endow others with miraculous gifts that he himself was able to perform true miracles? So Paul wants to give assurance to the church at Corinth that they were staying true to the faith, that they were not to go along with these Judaizers. So I think that's why we see in this passage of Scripture where it says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ, see you're on a firm foundation in Christ, and that's, that's all you need is Christ, and has anointed us as God. We're miraculously endowed teachers of God. We're true teachers of God is what Paul is trying to say. And has sealed us. We are able to perform true miracles in your sight. And then he says, and given us the guarantee of the Spirit in our hearts. So I think what we see here is it's some, this, whatever this earnest is, it's something that's very trustworthy. It's something that's all sufficient. It's something that you can really depend on. Well, let me ask you something. Is God faithful? Yes, He is. Is He trustworthy? Yes, He is. Is God a liar? No. Why? Because He cannot lie. And in, in God, are always He's going to speak the word of truth. And so that is God's pledge. That is His earnest to us that He will deliver this to us with full assurance because that's what the word of God is. It is all sufficient. In fact, that's what we see in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. I want you to read this very carefully with me. I think it's something very interesting that takes place. Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the guarantee or the earnest of the Spirit. And notice that who is he given this earnest to? He's given it to Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Now, here's something that's very interesting. Here Paul is starting to talk about what's going to happen at the end of time, that you know, there's going to be the Christians who are dead and those who are still alive are going to, of course, be transformed and have these, this new spiritual body. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of us have seen, if you're a faithful Christian, have seen this new body? None of us have, right? And as Paul would go on to say in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, what Paul means there is that when he talks about faith, he's talking about certainty, that you can have this knowledge, uh, you can know that it's true that you will have this new body, even though we have not seen it yet. Because we know it's the case because of the evidence of Jesus' resurrection. The historical evidence points to that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And from 1 Corinthians 15, we gather that Jesus is going to raise everybody else from the dead. And so that's why we walk by faith, because our faith is based on the evidence, not by sight. So how many of us fully trust God at His word that He will give us this new body if we live faithfully until death? 
Well, I, I hope fully that we have the conviction in our hearts that He will. Because we believe the Word of God. Because in God are the promises that are always faithful and true. So that's why in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, he says, So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So we see that the earnest, the pledge that God has that we will have this new body is indeed His Word. Well, what about Ephesians 1, 13 and 14? I'm looking at the American Standard Version and I want us to read this text very carefully. In whom ye also, having heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having also believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is an earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of God's own possession unto the praise of His glory. Now you'll notice in some translations, after the word promise, some will have, translations will have the word whom. Obviously, they believe that it's referring to the Holy Spirit. Some will have the word which is an earnest of our inheritance, and we're going to discuss what does that mean. Well, I think what we can do if we look on this chart is that I think what we see in the original text is kind of a, a if I may call it, a parenthesis. And usually, a, you know, a parenthesis is put to elaborate on something. So, I want us to think about this just for a moment, if we were to read it as a parenthesis. So if we have this chart, I want to skip the parenthesis. In whom ye also, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which is an earnest of our inheritance, unto the redemption of God's own possession, unto the praise of His glory. Because as you can see here on this chart, what we can do is, when we take that word earnest, I think what it's bringing us back to is the word, the gospel of your salvation. Because the gospel indeed is the sufficient word of God. It's the truth, and we can fully depend on the truth. That's God's pledge to us. So that's why I think what we have to do with regards to this passage of Scripture is that's what it's referring back to and not referring to the Holy Spirit. Because the, I mean, the, the Bible says in Titus 1, 1 and 2, Paul, bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, an acknowledgment of the truth which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So you can put your trust, indeed, in the Word of God. John 10, 35 and 36, the Bible says, If He called them gods to whom the Word of God came, and the Scripture cannot be broken, do you say of Him, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? How about Hebrews 11, verse 1? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you see, the faith is indeed the foundation of our hope. And we see that over and over again throughout the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. By faith, Abraham obeyed. He, God told him to get out of his land and go to a land where he had never been before. He obeyed because God's word said so. Well, we also read about many others. Noah I mean, he had faith in God's Word because God told him that there would be a great flood that would wipe out the wickedness of this world. So you see it in every single case in that, book, in that Hebrews chapter 11 hall of fame, of, of faith. So, and that's why we read about the source of faith. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6, notice what the Bible says. Now, by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whosoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. By this we know we are in Him. He who says He abides in Him, ought Himself also to walk, just as He walked. So, if you don't mind, let's look at this chart here, and I think we can see how we know we have an inheritance awaiting for the faithful Christian. First, we have, with regards to the Father, who desires to provide us an inheritance for His children. 
And so that's something that we need to recognize. In Matthew 25, verse 34, the Bible says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you from the foundation of the world. But we recognize that the inheritance had to be purchased for us. And the, that was purchased by the, by the price that it took, at the precious price of Christ's blood. And that the Son came into the world to die for our sins. And He came to redeem man from that slavery of sin. And so that's something we need to recognize with this regards to the plan of salvation, of how the earnest fits into this. But then we have, the, as, as it says in Ephesians 1, 13, 14, if we were, may read it again, In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and Him also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the guarantee of our inheritance, you know, referring back to the gospel, of until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. And so we see that those of us who are in the church, we have been purchased by Christ, and that we are, if we serve faithfully, we know that we're continually being cleansed by the blood of Christ, and that we will one day receive that great inheritance. But the Holy Spirit does play a part in how a Christian receives this, this inheritance and in that the inheritance is revealed to us. We wouldn't know about this inheritance unless it was revealed to us by the Word of God which came by the apostles and prophets which of course was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so we see that it's revealed and confirmed by the Holy Spirit. So that's why we see that we're to be faithful until the point of death as Revelation 2 verse 10 talks about. So we, all, we see the whole plan of redemption here. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit has given us the Scriptures to know about this inheritance, and that if we obey the Scriptures, we can have this inheritance. So that's why Peter would say in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So if you don't mind, if we look at this chart, you can see that we see that the inheritance is revealed by the Holy Spirit because He was able to miraculously endow, He was able to anoint those who would be teachers of the gospel in the first century, such as Paul, Silas and Timothy, they were anointed by the Holy Spirit. But we also see that they were confirmed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That they were able, uh, of course the apostles were the only ones to pass on these miraculous gifts. But we see also as well that there were those who were able to perform miracles to confirm that they were true messengers of God. And then we see the earnest. We see the Holy Spirit has indeed given us the earnest, the pledge that we can know that we are have the assurance of salvation by obedience to His Word. And we know that God will fulfill every promise of His. And so that's something that I think we need to recognize with this matter. So if we were to look at this matter on these different views of the Holy, uh, on the earnest of the Holy Spirit, we would fit it under the category that the language is figurative, uh, that it was something that was a non-miraculous, but it's also, we need to know that it's the Word of God. So, when I think about this matter, friends, I think about how, what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And you know, we wouldn't know about Jesus Christ unless it was for the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit who has revealed to us through the Scriptures the, the plan of salvation. As Paul would say, for I'm not ashamed of the power of the, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who that believe, to the, fir to the first, the, those who are Jews, and then to those who are Greeks. And so we see that in it is the righteousness of God. God has revealed to us how He can make man right again in His sight, because we have sadly alienated ourselves from God. We have sadly turned away from God. Each has turned aside to his own way. And, but the Lord is wanting to call us back through the gospel. And that if we will render faith and obedience to the gospel, 
we can be saved from our sins. And so I ask ourselves, are you a Christian? Have you, have you uh, begun your life in Christ? Because in order to go to heaven, we must be in Christ. Paul talks about that so much in the, in, throughout Ephesians, about being in Christ, being in the church that Christ built. You see, that's so important to be in His body because His body is the church. And so we see it's so very important, friend, that you recognize this matter. And so I would plead with you that we would, if you want to know how to become a Christian, that as the Bible says, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You must turn to this for your source of authority. You must abide by what God says, not by what man says, not by what the traditions of man says, not by what any creeds or, or any handbooks, but what does the Word of God say? Well, the Word of God has steps of salvation. It says that, as the Bible says, as Jesus would say to you, if you believe I am not He, you will die in your sins. Now, that's so very important, John 8, 24, that we believe Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. That's so very important. But see, friends, some people just take this to mean that it's just an intellectual ascent, that all I got to say is, Jesus Christ, come into my heart right now, and that all of a sudden you're just automatically saved. But friend, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that if you believe, then you will obey what God says. And so I want us to recognize that fact. So Jesus said, he that, that believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, verse 16. But you see, it doesn't just end with that. See, we must believe, we must repent of our sins, because that's what the Bible says as well. These times of ignorance God once overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, verse 30. We're to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Romans 10, 9, 10 states about that. And so your faith will, re, re, you know, will respond to being obedient by undergoing water baptism because that's where we come into contact with the blood of Christ. And you can see that God's earnest his his word is is true it is trustworthy it's something that will stand you can trust in the word of god if you will be obedient to his will and be faithful even unto the point of death you will indeed receive the crown of life